This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Kate Crawford has a SB in Mechanical Engineering from MIT, and then a Master's and PhD in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Princeton. <laughs> are, are there some other mechanical engineers in the room? <laughs> oh, Princeton alums, OK. <laughs> Anyone else from Princeton? Yeah, it's the MIT crowd that didn't That's true. The MIT crowd is not usually that verbal. <laughs> So um, in, in this program, her research and dissertation was on the area of simulation of turbulent flows on scale-out computer architectures. So this is how she had moved from mechanical engineering into computer architecture. And then after that, she worked at IBM and has over a decade of research experience in IBM um, in both research and development with deliverables that included things like low-level C code to a J2EE application um, to, to support research and doing tools for researchers. She's been an architect, a developer, a performance analyst, and also a customer consultant at IBM. Currently, she's the chief architect for Next Generation Systems Software and Solutions. Um, she's actually working with the cell processor, so the software development kit, or the SDK, for the cell broadband engine is one of her main responsibilities there now. We actually had a talk from Cell um, in the fall, so if people are interested in other background on Cell specifically, they can watch that talk. Although there, they didn't really go into the tools, so that's why we're excited to have you presenting today. So please welcome Kate Crawford. So, um, Before I start, I guess I should say, a few things to, to do even more to that intro. Um, given that I've been beaten up pretty, pretty well on Slashdot, um, I'm not a ch the chief architect at IBM. Um, I am sort of have a group that I'm the chief architect of. Um, first of all, IBM doesn't pay me to be chief architect. Um, and I don't want to get email from 300,000 IBMers asking me what they should be doing. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what I do. Um, the other thing is, is that this talk is kind of in a response to, uh, I wrote an article uh, with IEEE Times um, about, um, you know, given where we are with developing multi-anything in the world and where we are with true parallelism and applications, not just distributed, you know, um, multiple JVMs running places, but true parallelism and efficiency of exploiting parallelism, could we actually develop tools, frameworks, et cetera, to have applications sort of fit in um, and, and uh, really take advantage of all the parallel power out there. So that's why I'm here. Um, the other thing is, is, as you hear from my background, I have this much formal training in computer science um, and electrical engineering. Why is that good? I look at every computer built as why should this be used. I'm an application developer. So whenever I evaluate what we're doing within my own group, Whenever I look at how we're using things, my first question is always, how is someone going to use this? How is someone going to use this? What is the total cost of ownership for our company? You know, all those things like that. How is this benefiting application enablement? Um, so that's the view I'm really going to give here as well, is one of why are these things useful? How can we make them more useful? So sort of the outline I'll give is I really think it's important um, to describe a number of inflection points that we're at right now. One is, I come from industry. I'm in a company that's here to make money. Um, so we have to look at growth segments in industry of where IT is growing, server software, um, storage, network, all those things, where the applications are moving to, where people are spending money to buy systems. Um, from those segments, I'll say, here's kind of the applications and workloads and their characteristics, meaning their programming paradigms. 
And then I'll talk about those also with the next inflection point of here's where technology, whether it's silicon, network, all those things is going, um, the commoditization of scalable systems, all those things. And then talk about how we drive this into what we have for programming models, what's required, things like that. And I really want to drive especially to a group which is a class, people hopefully coming into industry to help us, this idea of pragmatic parallelism. And that's the thought that for the rest of the world, the people that I usually go to meet in industry, consulting, things like that, um, helping customers enable on systems, when I talk to an application developer, I'm typically looking at someone who has a bachelor's degree with Java experience. And that's the kind of folks that we're going to have to enable. So we really have to be pragmatic in these things. And again, talk about business views of this as well. And then talk a little bit about how we're addressing that in the cell software development kit and also hybrid computing and um, where I think this is all going. So industries and workloads. So if you look at um, whatever kind of segment uh, track watcher you want to look at, really kind of the market driven uh, areas of growth are in information based medicine, that's what I show here, which is your kind of imaging aspect of it, whether that's the actual um, imagery construction kind of pieces, pieces of it, um, or what we call uh, registration, which is pattern recognition, uh, things like that, as well as the actual entire digital archiving of everything. Um, so we're interested in that. Digital media, uh, clearly cell processor along with the other game console processors are going there, home media consumer electronics. Another area that we watch very carefully because of spend rates is financial services and we're really talking about capital markets. Um, not necessarily what we call back office uh, type applications, but where they're doing computations, Monte Carlo simulations, things like that. And another area that I'll just call rich media mining, the one that we like to talk about is digital video surveillance. Um, and when we kind of distill that down into workloads, characteristics, things like that, and requirements, we're really talking about real-time analytics, image creation, management, and unstructured data analysis. Um, so that's all these workloads. If you look there, this is where all people talk about rich media pattern matching, multimodal analysis, streaming data, all those types of things. Um, you know, one of the characteristics that we see is data, 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 more data, more data, more data. You know, this whole problem of how we're going to collapse all the amounts of data out there to get to um, some sort of content or context analysis, okay? So we look across all these workloads and we have to get to some sort of usage pattern. That's what we do as consultants. We look at a broad spectrum, we get it down to something simple. Um, and we really see two types of programming, the way people develop algorithms, codes, et cetera, for these type of application segments. One is something called uh, distributed object programming environment, and yes, you can figure out the four letters that we use to represent that, um, or data parallelism. And what it means is being able to, you know, in the simplest form, it's what everyone took in their first year of applications development for parallel systems, the master-slave type programming paradigm. But that's the simplest form. Obviously, there's other versions of that, mixing each and any's uh, broadcast, things like that. And then in today's world, given uh, the way people design algorithms, they're dynamic and fault tolerant. Um, and the idea there is that ver use very simple methods, focus on data distribution techniques. So how do you avoid block, what we call block synchronization programming? So compute, communicate, compute, communicate, things like that, very inefficient way of doing things. So, but if people can describe that, their data distribution pattern, how underneath the covers can we do asynchronous programming, data movement, and things like that. Um, the next one is just what we call streaming data flow. Some people call it FIFO-based programming because they're used to looking at um, inputs and outputs as a FIFO. And this is where you have sources, process elements, and sinks. Um, it's, this is very typical in any type of pattern recognition, uh, model building type scenario for, for multimodal analysis. 
Um, and it's a very almost dynamic sensor network where the inputs may change, but you also have, may have to send to uh, different outputs. And the other thing here is that the algorithms themselves are evolving to be much more dynamic. So they actually improve um, or give different fidelities based on the inputs they're connected to or what outputs are using them. So these are the kind of characteristics that we see. At the same time, we look at what technology is being driven out there. And we sort of see kind of at a very um, fundamental level this, kind, this idea of accelerators. Um, and that means taking something general purpose, which may be expensive either in terms of the processor or the memory or the network, um, and maybe do something more, more specialized, expensive either in terms of, usually what I'm talking about is power consumption, floor space, things like that. Um, so I gave sort of a three different views of this. Um, I'll start with the technology view, and that's the top level, where we look at kind of the accelerator uh, distance um, from the host, if you will. So the first is the accelerator I programmed on the most growing up, and that's the cluster, uh, where basically I could take an algorithm, use Amdahl's law, and speed it up just by being able to distribute the data, the processing, all those kinds of things. The other common one that we see is the I.O. slot. Uh, for all of you using various forms of GPUs to do some sort of computational offload, that's a type of accelerator that you use in the memory hierarchy. Now we see forms of onboard or, or what we call planar accelerators. This whole concept of doing some version of a cache coherent hypertransport, extended PCIe, all those types of things, plus cell, plus clear speed, throw your favorite processor on there. And then the actual system on a chip version of this, which is kind of the cell broadband engine itself. We have a general purpose processor, the PPE, plus some specialized vector units, the SPEs. Okay? Um, so technology is improving. Um, cheaper, faster, smaller, less power, all those things. Implementation examples, I just went through. But again, I want to focus on how people use these things. Um, so I put the programming model that typically people have used on the bottom. So various flavors of RPC in the cluster um, use whatever um, sockets, network-based, MPI over something you want to use. That's kind of uh, what you're doing, RPC, IPC. Um, but what's happened as we've improved the technology is we found different tweaks of the software to use to either fit in with the technology, be more efficient, expose more of the technology to the user, et cetera. And although one could claim that the bottom is a view that we are just developing more software to catch up with what we can do. We're helping the users find out more what to do in, um, with these new architectures, et cetera. If I were to show this to an information officer at a Wall Street bank at the way that technology is progressing and the way that applications are being written from a TCO perspective, total cost of ownership, application maintenance, all that kind of stuff, this is, looks horrible. How do you choose it? How do you maintain it? When do you shift code? Which co how long do you keep around code? Is there some way to consolidate this? So that's the big issue that a lot of, our, a lot of people out in industry are going to face, is that certainly some things may be more useful. When do you use it? Are all the tools catching up? Things like that, OK? So I also wanted to give a flavor of where are we today in terms of this? Um, this is actually happening now. We have to reconcile all these levels of the memory hierarchy. So what I want to show here is a version of a cluster or a system that's being built that's a combined distributed memory cluster as well as a hybrid accelerator. Um, there's information on this on the web. It's called the Roadrunner Project at Los Alamos National Lab. It's joint work between IBM and Los Alamos. And we're actually building a hybrid cluster. And we have to be in production pretty soon. And we have to consider distribu true distributed memory systems, a cluster, and making those efficient. And we also have to consider what we call these hybrid units, where we're going to have some sort of x86, in this case, it's, it's AMD Opterons, multi-core systems, 
connected to cell blades, okay? And the, the interposer, meaning the interconnect there, um, is varying over time the type of technology that we use, but basically we want to have essentially three levels of a memory hierarchy. We have SPE to PPE, then we have cell to AMD, and then we have AMD to AMD, whether in the multi-core or multi-processor sense. So this is a technology out there that we have to write software for today, and we're developing software for. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can I pick this up a little bit? So when you started, you said that you're a software person, you look at hardware and say, you know, why do I want to play with this thing? You know, there must be some value. So what is the value here? Let me ask the real question, which is, in the past, we also went after various hybrid, you know, exotic architectures, and at the end, the general purpose of the time mm -hmm. came in and it was much cheaper and it scaled better and it took over the world and so on. Are we in the situation where there's going to be a similar thing? So is this combination of all these exotic accelerators of any kind with general purpose fundamentally here to stay forever? Or is it again, could we have one or two generations and then the multi-core something, or whatever is the mainstream of the day, I don't know what it is, will come back and replace this all over again because of cost issues and easier to write software for the general purpose mm -hmm. because there are so many things out there. So what's the long-term view of this stuff? So, so, again, so my view is that where we are with here today, we, and I'll show it in subsequent slides, we definitely see customers moving to this type of hybrid architecture for power and cost reasons. Right, that, that seems to be a fundamental one. Um, cost also associated with performance on their application. So if you're a bank on Wall Street, if you're able to do more accurate simulations faster of trades than what your competition is doing, that's money. That's actual dollars to your business every day. But the question is slightly so, different. You know, what is the scaling story here? Because at any point in time, there's some delta between two yeah. architectures, fine. The question is, how does this delta change over time? So, so, so this is the architecture, I think, over the next five years to answer that question. Okay. Do I think at some point we'll have another technology bump where we may either scale frequency better for general purpose, come up with better network I.O. at a commodity level? You know, we, we go from 10 gigi to whatever, things like that. I think that bump's going to occur. And so my answer to that from a software point of view and from an application point of view is I know all these things are going to happen in technology in five-year increments, pick your, pick your end years. The point is, is can we develop APIs, tools, et cetera, that it can shoot that by at least two generations, so maybe 10 years. So we do both this hybrid architecture as well as catch the next generation of scale out. And so that's really what we're trying to address here. Because if you just develop software for um, you know, vector accelerators, you're probably only looking at what people are doing over you know, at, the, at what, what is the accelerator on Vogue right now, the dense, right? Very dense. Um, and I think it's going to happen just as you say. Five years from now, the I.O. will be the next thing. And so how can we, in software, kind of stay with that? Um, and so that's what I'll show in these next slides. So, so the example I'll give from financial services that's here today is you can actually go, what people do today, and this gets into this uh, over time technology statement too, is they first just worked on spreadsheets and had those connected to big iron SMPs. And the first thing they did was just figure out how to do some simple scale out over an 8-way, a 16-way, and things like that. Well, the next thing that came up was clusters. So they did RPC to uh, you know, Linux cluster, parallelization of the algorithm, things like that. Now they're on a cluster. Well, now they're on to, OK, we've gotten that point in scale out. But the way that we're going to do the cost efficiency curve now is we need to do some acceleration these hybrid architectures. And so this is the way that they're building these systems today, or looking at these systems today. This is a demo that we showed at Supercomputing um, in November, where these, also, these accelerators also come from DCC, digital content creation. Um, and again, people will do the actual visualization on the architecture that's good for that, typically an x86 
um, you know, Linux or, or Windows, but the computations and all the, and the intense I.O. will be done on a cluster, accelerators, things like that, okay? So these are real examples that people are trying to run today. But the question is, is that exactly what you were asking? How can we actually unify these different stages of technology? So um, one of the things that we have to do um, at a company like IBM is we, we can't waste money ourselves. So we never want to reinvent something that already exists just because we have people to write code. Um, our programmers are expensive too. So we looked at essentially how, what's out there today that could address these memory hierarchy issues and you know, could we extend something, could we learn from something, et cetera. Um, so the first one I actually looked at because um, this is what I was born and bred on is MPI, the message passing interface. It's kind of the de facto standard. You can get it anywhere. It's been around for a while. I've used it. I actually developed some of our own protocol stack um, on our early scalable parallel systems and things like that. But at the end of the day, you don't walk into, you typically do not walk into a Wall Street firm or you know a big information-based medicine software vendor and see them writing the dickens out of MPI. It's just not there. Um, so we had to figure out why. Um, the other thing is, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that and sort of the gap analysis. The other thing is, is that um, it didn't really address some of the asymmetries of multi-core, multi-process type processing. Um, so for instance, um, what if you really want to talk to these devices? And over time, a device could still be connected over the network, but we believe they're going to be out there, especially when you move to these streaming applications where you're talking to sources and sinks and things like that. Um, so what, what would it actually mean to talk to device endpoints, uh, things like that? Could you have that complex of an API to talk to those devices? Uh, POSIX sockets, everyone knows them, everyone learns them. That seemed like a good thing too. Um, and it's sort of distributed computing everywhere. People learn how to open a socket, build a connection or, or connectionless protocol, and talk from there. Um, and it's actually outside of kind of universities, national labs, and technical computing. It's the thing used everywhere. But again, it's, it had, um, it didn't have this concept of devices. And you also couldn't describe topologies. There's no such thing as a topology in POSIX sockets. And no one really knew how to start building tools over sockets either. You know, how do you do low-level tracing, um, things like that. And then there's the broad collection of uh, multi-core languages already out there. OpenMP, UPC, um, you can go to various uh, vendors out there. Um, I decided not to put any of them since I didn't want to. <laughs> if I picked one, I was, I was sure to offend someone. Um, but really what those things kind of rely on, if you're going to go to multiple ISAs and multiple memory hierarchies, is all these compiler people getting together and agreeing on this is how we're going to couple things across ISAs. And that seems longer term than, than where we were at. Um, and the other thing was, again, how do you now start to catch up with doing hybrid versus scale out versus all of those things? Um, and again, will compilers look at devices? That seemed to be our other question there. So, so we, we, we decided to, um, look at all, we looked at all these things for a long time, not only ourselves, but actually talking to customers and Los Alamos as well. Um, again, because this sort of came out of having to build these large clusters with them. And we really went back to, well, well what do we want to say about programming models and where we are? First of all, you go to anyone out there, we've got a lot already. There's no need, you know, why would we go and have something new? Um, you know, we have tons of ISAs out there. Um, enough languages to, to fill most any industry technical computing lab out there. Um, and then there's also all these ways of doing um, multi-core type programming. So if we start to work on something, we better have a really darn good reason to do it was the understanding. And the other thing was is, given the complexity of what's out there in terms of programming models, 
and programming languages and all that stuff, stick to simple on the actual implementation. And we always say, I'm sorry, stick to simple in the description, in the APIs, in the way you use it. Not try and do every application in the world. Not try and do the applications that these other things are very well suited for, things like that. Solve the problem we're trying to solve, which is look at these different types of architectures, hybrid, scale out, things like that, specifically at these industry segment applications that no one else seems to be catching, and really have the art of the implementation and what we're doing and the engineering underneath, and really focus on the tools. So that was our, our big goal. And so when we said, do we need any more, the consensus we had, um, although potentially not popular to talk about in a computer science problem, is we don't need a new language. There's not a, a customer I can go to and say, I've got a new language for you. It's not going to work there. So the consensus was, we have to stick to the things people know, C, C++, Java. That was the big thing. Um, even when you have new architectures, like Cell BE, don't introduce a new language if you want to have broad market acceptance. Um, but the feedback was better tools and frameworks. That's really what was driving this. Um, and again, focus on things like we don't need all these APIs. We want simple APIs. And we want to focus on the data distribution problem. Okay, That was really one of the issues. Um, from a TCO perspective, this whole idea of people developing, again, APIs specific to an architecture to get 20% you know, more optimization than having more general APIs. You know, the, I, I had someone tell me um, at one software vendor for, for libraries say, you know, our biggest problem is getting things up as quickly as possible on new architectures. And then over time, as we're ready, optimize for architectures. Their issue was how quickly can they get up and running on something new and then understand that architecture through their own application. So that was really important. And although it was good news for me, as a PhD really well versed in MPI, um, we're actually expensive. And again, when you look at total cost of business more and more, especially given with commodity scale out systems, commodity networks, all those things, um, the cost of keeping applications up and running and tuned and stuff is, is the human cost. Um, so we really had to look at how we're going to enable, again, this broad spectrum of people. So we, we went down to the core of what's missing. We heard this concept of MIMD type semantics. And I, I guess the best way to describe it is a focus on kind of distribution of labor. That there, is, there are going to be people who someone will keep around to optimize codes as new ISAs come out. But for that ISA, looking at almost like a single core point of view. They'll understand that instruction set. They'll optimize. They'll be able to understand a very, that memory hierarchy, things like that. But the concept of how to build more general scale out and how to deal with I'm going from one ISA to another, I'm going uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer type system versus hierarchical, they wanted to be able to move that between users. Um, so this concept of MIMD type semantics came out. The other thing was, in stream processing, being able to describe not all codes of the same executable, but multiple types was very important. Um, having dynamic algorithms. Basically, what that means is you may not have collectives anymore, all these uh, dependencies necessarily, but you will have groups. So you can improve your algorithm as new processors or new cores are added or new storage, or you can improve as new data types are added, um, things like that. Um, and the other thing is this whole concept of data-centric programming. So first and foremost, understanding data distributions, how you want to divide the mesh of your computation, what's the best way to do that, and having the tools that support that. Um, so really looking at this concept, and I'll introduce it later, of what is a computational work block fundamentally? 
and how do you need processing on that work block and things like that. So this was sort of, um, and also the efficient data representation for marshalling and demarshalling. So is there some way that we can make that simple and efficient for people to understand and write code with? So now I'm going to show my, my, everyone gets to show who's a software architect always has to show the birthday cake chart. So here's mine. Um, so we're developing two, uh, two pieces of, of sort of framework code to do this. Um, one is called Accelerator Library Framework ALF, and the other is called Data and Communication Synchronization Library. Uh, back at the farm, we call them ALF and DAX, and we obviously have pictures for them too, for those of you that are ALF fans and Star Trek fans. Um, so how do we come up with that? So the first thing is, is that you'll see from this chart up here that our view of how you're going to be able to maintain codes over time to work with these technology jumps, it's going to be by developing core sets of libraries, right? And really instilling software engineering at that level to be able to have libraries that you build from, large applications, et cetera, um, that over time, if you want to further optimize those libraries, you can. The second thing we wanted to do was we wanted to separate the data communication synchro synchronization of an application, which tends to be more architecture specific, away from the data distribution view of it. So you'll see in the, in the slides that I'll go through, data and communication is really about DMA. It's really about moving data. It's about three kinds of data moving. One is send receive type, which is probably the more common way people do sockets or MPI based programming. The other is remote DMA, which our experience from people programming on cell processors and devices like GPUs and things like that is a more efficient way of moving data, asynchronous DMA, mailboxing, short messages well placed in your code are also things that we've learned um, are a great way to build features into an application. We wanted to take away the things that, again, get hairy as you move across other architectures or two, error handling. So have a simple way of viewing an error um, and being able to handle it and pass it remotely as well. So we had that synchronization. Um, very simple locking, both, both for processes and data. So how you can do barriers and groups easily, um, things like that. Process management, and the big one up there is topology. Because one thing that we know right now, building these clusters uh, with Los Alamos, these systems, is part of being able to do efficient data movement is understanding your topology. And that can be topology at a processor level, memory level, or what we call the interposer or network level, understanding that. Um, now, the piece that sits on top of that that's more involved with data partitioning and just what we call workload distribution, which again is this division of labor philosophy, is ALF. That also has some error handling and more advanced process management. Um, but again, really it's focused on how do I want to do data distribution? How do I define a work block? Um, do I want to do cyclic? You know, the standard ones you see in HPF, but some new ones that we're developing, again, for these target workloads. On this side is actually probably the most important piece that we're working on at all, which is IDEs, GDBs, trace analysis, all those types of things, which is, again, learning from what we've seen with the cell processor. Those are tools that are essential. Um, for getting people to understand these memory hierarchies, understanding where your DMAs are inefficient, things like that. So building on what we're doing for cell, extending that to hybrid type computing as well. What platforms are we going to do? So obviously, 
This is going to work on cells. So that's the MFC, the memory flow controller. Um, everything else under here is kind of what it could be done on. And so that's our view of this is we want this programming framework to be open. We're developing it right now with Los Alamos, working on APIs, et cetera. But our hope is to release these and get other people to tell us how we should do it as well, how we should extend the APIs, how we should work on them, not just from you know, academia and the labs and things like that, but from industry as well. We're working with industry partners on this right away too. Um, the other thing is I want to say is that will we allow the super user to go and program to DAX? Absolutely. There's always going to be um, the people that think they can write their own work blocks better, uh, do their own data communication uh, or, or, or handlers better than we do in ALF, and, and we're allowing that too. So this is kind of the framework um, where we start to talk about this idea of pragmatic parallelism. This is our view, um, at least for now. And like I said, it's evolving because we do want it to be open. Um, on how we think we're going to um, enable these applications. So what are these things? DAX is really focused on data movement permanence. So it's DMA-like interfaces, puts, gets, put list, get list, um, asynchronous type thing. It's, but it's also messaging interfaces, again, um, for things that are more efficient to do synchronously. And then the mailboxing concept of small Small, uh, we call them, uh, sometimes you want to leave crumbs um, to know where you've been, where you should be going to other parts of your application. It's based on uh, a standard Windows and Channels architecture, um, a very simple concept that works well for whether it's processors or devices to build a window somewhere, connect the channel, and be able to put and get data from there. Okay. Um, it has double and multi-buffering um, because one of the things that we find are the big inefficiencies as you start to scale out algorithms, architectures, what have you, is this idea of the block synchronous programming. So you wanted to do that. And more and more architectures, whether they're hybrids, hierarchies, or networks, you're really getting efficient data transfer when you can maximize all available bandwidth and sort of minimize any inherent latency by doing this multi-buffering. And the idea was, if we can do it in DAX, then the user probably doesn't have to worry about how to do the multi-transfer at once. Our first set of requirements um, sort of comes from supporting ALF and these target industry applications. So we're really focused this year to get something out. And the idea is then, the more people we get using it, we can you know, adjust and work through it. Um, but, but our first set of requirements is really to, to drive that type of development. Just to clarify, you, you have a uh, separate <coughs> memory space for all of these individual components and the message passing between you don't try to simulate a shared memory environment. Uh, no, there's other, there's other, even on, so even on the cell broadband engine architecture, I'm talking about um, one set of programming models that we're working on that we think kind of have this potential for unification. That's sort of the way we see it. For ways to simulate true SMP type stuff, for those of you that have played with the, the cell SDK, there's something in there called the software managed cache, which is for another set of applications which you know, is another great programming model if people want to use those to, to go after. And obviously, ISVs are coming out with things as well. Um, so this was, like I said, we didn't want to repeat something that we knew others were going to do that, went out, you know, that wasn't suited for that application. So there's, there's a lot of other people looking at like um, single source compilers and, and whatnot for Cell as well. So. ALF is a true division of, of labor approach. Um, by the way, for those of you that would like to see, so DAX is coming out later this year. ALF is actually out in the SDK that you can get today. If you go to the AlphaWorks Developer Works website and pick up SDK 2.1, you can see what ALF looks like, play with it, get an idea of what the APIs look like, see what we're working on. And that's for very specific. Uh, the implementation right now is for Cell. 
and the, what we're doing for future releases is to support this x86 and cell um, hierarchy. Um, it's a wrapper for computational kernels, and you synthesize the kernels with data partitioning. That's really what it is right now. Um, it sounds simple, but for a large community of multi-core, multi-processor developers, the way that we're programming with this is a big step for them. Um, it has uh, a way of handling these accelerators or endpoints. It's both dynamic, but it provides these simple locks to provide synchronization um, for data processing and the processing itself. Remote error handling, again, so you don't have to worry about where the errors are coming from, um, all those types of things. Uh, <coughs> but one of the real powerful parts for these programmers who, again, their view, view of scale-out has just been to run multiple copies of the code everywhere, has been this concept of data partitioning and list creation from either samples, from templates. Um, it will be connected to an IDE, so you can actually see it graphically. Um, and again, the implementation underneath is very efficient. So you don't have to worry about optimizing for that architecture. Um, it's done for you. Um, it's stateless right now. In future releases, we plan to provide stateful context. So between processes, you can also share information about um, data processing and distribution, things like that. Um, it's extensible to a variety of data partitioning patterns. But we're very careful when we evaluate what we're doing. Again, we don't want to repeat everything that's already out there. So if you really want to have um, a very general collective communication type pattern to fit, you know, doing turbulent computations or combustion, your bet is probably to go with MPI. We're not trying to have ALF do that. Um, specific, you know, that's not the thing we're trying to go after. Um, right now, our prototypes, uh, again, if you look in the latest SDK, you can see what we're developing. Um, the Fast Fourier Transform, TRE is Terrain Rendering Engine. It's the demo that you almost always see developed with um, Cell. Uh, Sweep 3D is a code from Los Alamos, Black Scholes, and various linear algebra routines. Um, matrix multiply, ma matrix add, I think. Um, so you're able to see how we use it. So this is kind of the general architecture slide that's in the ALF documentation. There's a lot of documentation on these websites, by the way, on what ALF is. And two, a few things I'd like to, to point out about this. Um, first of all, the code that um, the user has to write in this point is really the computational kernel and what we call the accelerator library, which is more the APIs. That's where you're actually including some of the ALF APIs. Everything else, all the other actual puts, gets, sends, receives, moving of data, um, error handling is done by ALF. So that's, like I said, it's a big step for a lot of people out there who are trying to develop for these, these applications. Um, and what you have to understand kind of in your code view is creating these things called work blocks and associating a computing task, meaning defining your computational kernel to the work block. Okay, defining what type of work block you need, if it's a read work block, if it's a write work block, um, things like that. Like I said, it's very simple APIs. And we're trying to do a lot of the work in the implementation. So this is kind of the core of what the architecture is. Know that scratch pads are of certain size, or does ALF do its magic and take care of that? I'm sorry, the what? So do I need to know that every uh, synergistic unit has a certain memory capacity, or does ALF abstract this out? So that? in this version right now, your code runs most optimal if you know to align your work blocks. No, you're talking about alignment. You're talking about size. So there is a certain size of local memory allocated with each one of these units. And do I need to know it as a programmer or does I'll abstract it out? Like, so you'll get most, you'll get, in this, the current release that's out there, 
if you don't have it the size that we think can fit based on what we've kind of guessed at your stack size, things like that will give you an error and we'll tell you why. Okay. So again, the idea was we'll get you up and running fast. And so you did get your code up and running. And when we tell you you need to start shrinking your work block, now you can start optimizing. But your code is still up and running, you, you know, and you got a pretty quick answer why it wasn't. Okay. Um, we've thought about trying to guess at repartitioning. Um, I think. We look at things as things we can do in product in this year or next year, and things that are more long-term research. And the guess at how you would repartition based on a dynamic stack size and things like that, I think we're going to do more long-term. The APIs don't, don't constrain you. Um, if someone wanted to develop an implementation that did that, that's fine. Um, so for any of you that have programmed on uh, memory hierarchies, the one thing that you understand when writing your application is uh, data placement in the different types of memory is, <laughs> is a big issue for performance. Um, so one of the things we do work on is what you really define in ALF is the data transfer list. Okay. And its optimal placement is one of the things we're working on. And this is important, especially for those of you that have programmed on cell. Um, you know that a lot of the performance can come with how you actually do moving memory between the PPE and, or system memory and the SPE. And we think that this is just a trend that will continue, um, especially when you go to heterogeneous clusters, when you start to move data over different types of networks, things like that. So this is actually, I'll show a couple of slides. Like I said, I got a, a lot of help here uh, from a lot of people developing code. So this is a slide um, developed by one of the developers we have who writes code even internally um, for Cell and who's very good at it, uh, who loves programming on it, but had to explain to a class about what you have to think about when you're writing code for Cell. Um, and this is what you do in a cluster, what you do in anything as well. You have to think about uh, task management, scheduling, messaging interfaces, building an actual task queue, um, optimizing your computational core, memory management. Again, local memory management is an issue if you're writing optimized code for cell or cluster. Um, data movement, all those types of things. Okay, so this is sort of one view of multi-core programming. And this is what the view was of what we did with ALF for them, is that they now had to focus on writing the library with these APIs for ALF, the acceleration library, and then focus on their computational core. And again, the idea is get up and running quickly and spend the time that you need or have to do optimization up to that level. Don't assume <laughs> that people have to optimize right out of the gate. Again, they, it's much more efficient, we thought, if you get up and running and then you optimize with your application as you need it. Now, you're assuming here basically that a work block is more or less memoryless, right? You, you create a work block, you ship it off somewhere, something gets done, another work block comes back, but there's no inherent sequentiality in a given uh, target, target SPU or whatever of work blocks, right? Sequence, defining that type of sequence and things like that is done with some of the barrier op so you can, So you can synchronize across work blocks if you want to define some sort of task sequence or data sequence. Um, again, if you look in the documentation, you pay a price every time you want to synchronize like that. Yeah, but then it matters where the work block ends up. So if they're Absolutely, and so that's why we're actually starting to create this idea of statefulness as well. Okay, so you are going to statefulness now. We, we are trying to get there, yes. So we understand that's, a, that's a, something we're working towards. Now, statefulness is a whole new set of questions. How long do you maintain state, things like that. Um, so the way that we're looking at statefulness is, again, from an application point of view, looking at some applications that need it right away, enabling those and doing the best we can with APIs to make sure 
that the APIs themselves are not such that it, it, um, you could add new features underneath. For instance, you know, could we time out states based on either time of execution or time that it goes back to, right? Uh, can you have a lock just around state itself so you kind of have a state controller? Some, some people write codes that way too, that there's sort of this master node that's just in charge of knowing when data is complete, right? Uh, needle in the haystack problems. Everyone computes and computes and computes until some master controller says, no, we're done, and then refreshes everyone's state. Okay, so, so that's the kind of code that we're looking at for that. Um, so I guess I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions and stuff, so I'll move into a summary and a, and a future directions. Um, so I think the important thing to realize is um, even if, although I'm not advocating this at all, even if we stop doing technology development today, would we have this problem in software? Yes, we do. Because multi-splat exists today. People are dealing with it. It's the way they're scaling. It's the way they're getting better uh, performance, not just in terms of flops, right? Because commoditization has made flops actually um, pretty available at reasonable cost, even at multi-splat, and we're talking memory and I.O., okay? So these systems are out there. So the biggest issue I see is not that are these systems available, but the tools, the frameworks, et cetera, to enable folks like Los Alamos who are, you know, potentially have the people to really understand all these things, et cetera, but also um, sort of a broader industry which will really drive adoptance of this as well as the investment um, into these tools, frameworks, software, et cetera. Um, also looking at applications which are computational in nature and obviously really need the flops um, or operations, but are real-time and rich media in nature, um, where parallelism is really needs to be exploited um, to be able to solve these problems. So one way to look at where we're coming to right now is in terms of the data, data everywhere problem is that we're, we're looking at problems or a problem space where the rate and pace at which data is created far outpaces a human ability to be able to go from data to synthesize information and then distill knowledge. And that's really the, the kind of application problem that we're at today. For most of it can be an ICU nurse. We're able to generate all types of data for critically care patients. The question is, is how are we turning that into knowledge that someone like a nurse can use? Okay. So, so that's sort of the application. At the same time technology is changing, that's kind of the application and workloads that I, that I think we're driving towards as well. And so one of the things that I've introduced here is this concept of pragmatic parallelism. One pragmatic in that we have to be pragmatic about how people would or could adopt and consume a new language and industry, even with these new architectures, as well as let's not reinvent kind of thing that's already out there, right? Um, so that sort of pragmatism, as well as the pragmatism about staying fairly simple in what we're doing from the API perspective, but also really understanding how people need to do data distributions. And again, the, the art of the engineering is in the implementation across multiple architectures that can withstand the test of time. And so we talk about it in terms of both system on a chip as well as this hybrid cluster technology, things that we have to deliver. So, so where are we going? Um, so again, in terms of the cell SDK, the one that's out there right now is 2.1. Um, if you want to understand what ALF looks like today, you can go out to IBM AlphaWorks and DeveloperWorks and look at ALF. And uh, since I get to see a lot of the email, once people play around with it and tell me how it's not working and what should change, feel free. This is my invitation. Go out, use it, 
Um, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what we're doing wrong. Tell me what we're doing right. Um, and, and, you know, we, we really do want to focus on open and widely available. Um, I think, as, again, as these architectures change and as we're moving towards these applications, um, real-time analytics and, and multimodal analysis, we're really looking at total time to solution. I mean, everyone talks about it, but how can we address it with the constraints that we're in um, as sort of, again, industry broad adoption? which means we're really looking at development time, worry-free maintenance, and have performance improvements in the framework. Like I said, get me up and running quickly and let me determine as a customer, as a user, how much optimization I need to do by maybe peeling back the layers of the onion. And we really are you know, looking for extensions to other types of streaming applications. So one thing that you might notice in ALF, although we are planning to do an MPMD type implementation at some point, um, something we'd like to do, we're not necessarily talking about uh, MPMD where you have to do streaming balancing. So one thing that you see in sensor network programming is uh, fan in and fan out problems. So, and, and um, how to avoid uh, various types of waiting and network contention and all that types of things. Meaning, and you see this especially in, in architectures like Cell, when you are trying to assign computations of different types across SPEs or across nodes in various points in a cluster or network, how do you do the load balancing such that the computational time it takes on various types of ISAs and processors um, with one kernel is balanced with the network time to send data or the memory copies, et cetera, to get to the computation of the next filter, for instance. And so we're really looking to see how, the, the, how we should continue to evolve these types of APIs to also cover that type of streaming. Does it even fit within this API spec or is there another one that we need to work on or a modification, all those types of things? We really are looking at more platforms. This isn't just about cell. This isn't just about clusters. Uh, we want to know, uh, again, to make this truly extensible and adoptable, how do we get this working between x86 and GPUs as well? To understand topologies there, to be able to create data movement there, um, you know, how to look at multi-core in general. So I think kind of the, the final message is, is that, um, you know, when, when this article first came out on, on uh, IEEE and the subsequent uh, flow of, of thoughts that came on Slashdot, um, you, know, you know, a lot of what I got from that was, you know, what's here? It seems like this is architecture, this is all that stuff. And, and so one of the things I want to tell you is, you know, go out and look at Al and see what it looks like. And, you know, we released the, the DAX API spec and, and some of that. Go look at that. Um, we want this to be open. We want a community to help drive this. And we want to extend it as well. Because, like I said, what will really kind of have broad adoption in our industry and continue to push these improvements in software is the feedback that we get from a developer community that says, this is where the technology is going, and sort of here's how we know how to drive the software. So I thank you for your attention, and I guess I have about 10 minutes for questions. Thanks. So DARPA has the uh, high pro productivity programming environment initiative. Mm -hmm. IBM gives a big chunk of money for that. Mm -hmm. Is your work related to that in any way? Um, so actually, I know the Perk Software Architect pretty well at, uh, at IBM. And um, we share thoughts there. I think, um, so is any of this related? Certainly, right? We share ideas. We talk about how things should work. Um, I think within that project, they're probably a lot more focused on MPI and some of the applications that are already scaling. Um, so 
and there's other languages. other languages, right? And remember, that's that's I think with any uh, research-funded project, you have different timelines of discovery as well. Um, and their timeline is a little bit further out than what we have to get out today. And I think that that's one of the things that drives it, as well as kind of this notion we have of broad industry adoptance. We want to make sure I can also have this work when I go to a bank on Wall Street. But you still have the same endpoint goal. Um, right, so different discovery. Right, different discovery points and, and, and uh, different timelines, I think. So I guess first I want to commend you on your heroic efforts to make self-programmable. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And so I this is being recorded, so I'll, that's the first piece I'm going to show to everyone back at the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I'd like to know, I mean, if, if you were part of maybe the cell architecture team at the beginning, maybe how would you have instructed them to do differently or maybe said another way, what kind of parts of the hardware architecture really caused you the greatest consternation? Hmm. So, first of all, my disclaimer is I was not part of the original team. <laughs> uh, so how would I have changed it? That's a good question. I think when I started programming on cell, um, one of the things that was hardest for me, which is not necessarily hardware architecture, but was actually figuring out, as everyone does, combinations of registers to get the trace results you need, right? And I mean, that's any architecture. Um, but I think with cell, because you had all the registers across the SPEs, you know, it, it got a little harder. So one of the big steps we've made, if you look at SDK 2.1, I don't know if you have, is, okay, we've actually done a lot to make that easier for people. Um, you know, the GDB is now combined, so that was another thing. Um, but uh, so you can look across PPE um, and SPE, and the GDB is now integrated into an IDE. So I think those kinds of things. You know, people ask me all the time about, um, like I said, I'm an, I'm an application person, so they're like, oh my god, how did you start, you know, text, data, everything, 256 KBs, you know, and, and I wrote pretty big honking codes to do calculations, and I think the way I look at it is this. When I started to write codes for it, like I said, it actually made my codes become better overall, even on other systems, because you had to pay so much attention to memory, the memory hierarchy that is actually inherent in every architecture out there. Mm -hmm. How long you want to keep data persistent. You can't do block synchronization, which is the way people program SMPs today. They do it in parallel. Um, so you actually got better doing, doing more things like that. So I think that's, you know, um, we're learning, a lot of what we learn from Cell about how to do more efficient programming You'll see that reflected in ALF as well. And, and I think that's a good thing. And, and that's what we've heard from others as well. Well, it seems to me that what you've done is you've encapsulated the uh, hard parts of the architecture into some predefined library modules and then exposed the libraries. Uh, that's got a cost associated with it because uh, you are, in fact, limiting the capabilities of the machine. And able to take advantage of the uh, opportunities that are presented by the uh, mm -hmm. uh, inhomogeneities in the architecture, mm -hmm. for example. Um, what, do you, what do you think the cost is? Is it 50%? Uh, uh, so, um, I'll give you, because we haven't uh, released our papers yet, I can give you orders of magnitude kind of stuff. Um, we compare various types of algorithms uh, between what we call hand optimized on cell and ALF, and you know, depending on what we do, they can be in the order of, and this is typical for many frameworks, you know, 10 to 30 percent overhead. Um, so, am I happy with that? You know, of course, I'm, I was a performance analyst. I'm, you know, I want that to be as small as possible, but I'm also a realist. And really, when we talk about total time to solution type problems, I, I, keep, I keep focusing on this get people on the system. And we're, because what they're going to optimize is once they get their algorithm and application up and running, and then can use tools to optimize that way. It's through their application that they're going to optimize. So, you know, we don't assume 
right away that codes at the execution time are going to be 97% efficient or, or you know, use some, some metric of efficiency you want. Again, a lot of times the hardest part is just getting up and running. And so that's the time that we wanted to cut down. Um, we're always going to try and, just like any MPI uh, developer out there, right? they're always going to want to reduce latency and improve bandwidth and you know, reduce your code path lengths and stuff like that. Um, but again, are you happy, even for low level C hackers like me, um, I'm still much more happier writing code in C than I am in assembly. You know, so th that's kind of the way I look at it too. I know. I, I, I hate making that comment because I always find someone that raises their hand and says, I still work on VHDL. Okay. <laughs> uh, just going back again to the library issue. Uh, the li using the library and a particular API for the library uh, really does bias the uh, design of the uh, uh, higher level units. So your 10 to 30 percent numbers uh, reflect comparisons against the similar architectures, uh, but uh, different implementations, really. Yeah, and I think the other thing that, um, the other thing that we want to get into this mode of, too, if we're going to need to start to develop libraries like this and understand that we're going to provide libraries for which people will probably want to do further optimization, we have to be open. We've got to show people how we're writing this library code. And I think we realize that um, because I imagine that once you link in the libraries and you want to be able to actually see what source is running and you see the way that we're moving data underneath the covers, I can, you know, that may happen. And so allowing, it's, it's kind of another challenge in software engineering um, almost to be able to do m modular enough developments so that you, you do allow people to pull this apart um, and not just look at the source but this is the part I want to use. And is that in ALF right now? No. I have to be honest. We haven't gotten to that point of modularity. Do we know it's, I mean, Los Alamos has asked for this. Um, so we know it's something that we have to get to. So since we can't you know, look at ALF right now here, can you <laughs> describe some of the steps that a user would take to you know, represent work blocks and the computing tasks? Yeah. And the data so there's actually, and um, I have. I should have brought another presentation for that, but um, there's a really good tutorial on it um, online, again, as well, to look at it. But we've even changed the documentation so that our first step is always think about the way you want to move data. That's always the first step. So we say things like, you know, do you want data to reside? Um, the same piece of data do you need to move at once to all processors, right, meaning all SPEs. So we talk a lot about, so the first thing to understand is some data distribution patterns. Um, and we go back to basic algorithm kind of implementations too about um, data layout. So do you want to do row major? Do you want to do column major? If it's a matrix, can you represent in 3D? You know, we talk about dense. If you can make things dense, you're always going to do better. Um, for, for a lot, again, for a lot of the ICEs out there, that, that's one of the things that comes up. Um, so, so we talk a lot about data. And so when you're developing any type of code, we're trying to get people used to this idea of data, data movement, uh, partitioning, and things like that. The next thing is, um, what do you want your computational kernel to look like? So do you want to have all the computational kernels run at once? Do you want to run some with these blocks, some with those, you know, Things like, so we talk about staggering. Um, so you have to think about how you actually want your computation spread out now. Is it going to be a SIMD model or SPIMD model? Things like that. Um, and then we, you know, we even make points about um, synchronization. So um, when you first start developing any type of parallel code, um, and, and you get this when you look at people, code and you can tell where they are in developing stages. When you're early on, there tends to be a lot of synchronization. So you have to make trade-offs between synchronization and performance. And so when people first start out, we talk about, you know, synchronize where you think you need to. 
and then use trace analysis to take those away. So I think, you know, the way I always describe it is think about data distribution, think about your process allocation, and then think about where you really need to put synchronization and locks. But it reminds me of the multi-core framework from Mercury. How would you compare it to the um, two? So, like I said, for enablement on cell, we want as many frameworks as possible. Um, so I'm glad MCF is out there. Um, and I hope it's successful, actually, especially on enabling cell. Um, I think there are some differences um, in First of all, what is an, more what isn't an ALF, meaning uh, right now it's, there's no um, GUIs tightly bound to it. Um, there's, uh, there's no um, other sort of pieces wound into it. It's really just a set of APIs and a library you link in. Um, we're kind of developing around it. Um, but like I said, we're trying to develop around that such that you can also pull it apart, um, making you able to do that. I think the concept of doing block management is, is HPF does it, uh, you know, things like that. Um, then there's design philosophies behind it too. Um, we want um, ALF to be open. Uh, I'm not going to... Right, we want to proliferate it in that fashion. Um, we wanted to make sure the ALF APIs were not just cell. And I think you'll see that when you look at it. So, and not just kind of embedded processing. We wanted to work for clusters, right? Um, we wanted it to uh, um, have this notion of you could build tools with it, right? Not, not you know, you didn't have to have ALF and the ALF tool bound. You, you could do things with it. So I think there's some architecture pieces, but also some just design philosophies. Um, I think there's room for both. And like I said, I, I, if I think all these things, you know, RapidMind and PeakStream and, and everyone coming up with something for cell that you may have heard of, I think is a good thing. Um, one, I think we're all going to learn, right? Um, because like I said, these architectures are here. Um, but the other thing is, even where I sit, the more things that we have to enable people for the various flavors of writing applications, the better off we are. Uh, I, I don't have a good feel for the economics of this whole thing. Uh huh. How many, I mean, a bank, how much computing infrastructure do they have back there? How many people do they have generating <laughs> programs? <laughs> So, so, given that you probably don't have a non-disclosure agreement or anyone else here with the banks I work with, I actually can't tell you. But it's pretty big. Big enough so that we pay attention. How's that? Expense to, you know, computing infrastructure expense. Um, is, it, is it appropriate to think in terms of having an in-house expert to help tune, the, tune, tune things up? Some banks do. The big high-end banks certainly do. Um, probably more than one. Uh, it's it's um, you know I think it'll be interesting to see. I think the way I would answer that is it would be interesting to see if over the next n years uh, we had banks starting to enter the top 500 at a pretty high rate and pace. It would be interesting to see if, if that would, you know, and, and part of that gets into the culture, too, of starting to release what they have, which is, you know, one of the competitive secrets they keep. There's actually an interesting article, op opinion, in Business Week that uh, Dave Turek from IBM just wrote about how supercomputing is going into all of these industries. We have one more question. Is there any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Okay. So you, you've picked the low-hanging fruit. You've got a programming model that 
cover certain aspects. Is this designed so that it can evolve into a general purpose parallel framework? Boy, I hope I hope we're getting there. Um, but I'd be careful to talk about general purpose. Like I said, um, general purpose oftentimes gets you into a lot, a lot of APIs, you know, complexities, and things like that. Um, we're gonna, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. In some ways, is this an experiment that we're trying to do real time? You betcha. Um, but I think we have a pretty good shot. Mostly because, again, of this design philosophy of if we can maintain some simplicity, have the art of the engineering under the covers, and try and not just focus on a single architecture or things like that, and look at applications that have not, you know, met the benefit of Amdahl's law somewhere else, I think we have a reasonable shot at it. My experience is if you're not careful, you paint yourself in an architectural hole. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the biggest... Uh, that's why we've been very focused on, for instance, making ALF right away, not just sell, that we can do this hybrid model right away, too. All right. Well, that will have to be the last question because we're out of time. One quick announcement. Just next week's talk is also about parallel processing. We'll have a speaker from Stream Processors talking about the software tools. That'll be your lesson of the compiler's group. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.